Okay, you guys have to move down a little bit. Stand with us and instant to worship with us this morning. Hope you guys all have a good week. Thank you, Jesus.
just lift up shot of grace so yeah. Yeah. Just lift up the arm of grace this morning. Say he's so good. Turn your neighbor and say he's so faithful. Oh, 
the gospel true The world shall not kneel and shall not faint But his blood and in his name In his freedom I am free For the love of Jesus Christ Christ was born, then the Spirit lit the flame, and the gospel to the world that shall not kneel, that shall not fail, by His blood and in His name, in His freedom I am free, for the love of Jesus Christ, who is with us. We 
give us pure hearts. Let us not lift our souls to another. And give us clean hands. And give us pure hearts. Let us not lift our souls to another. And God. Generation that sees, seeks your face, O oh God and Jacob, and God let us be the generation that sees, in your face, O oh God, to sing that, to give us clean hands, to give us clean hands.
do you trust me? And that posture went from this with those weights to this. And those weights turned into an anchor. And it wasn't an anchor that held still. It was an anchor that was grounded in him. And as we begin to trust him, and we go from this posture to this posture, we take our hands off of it and it becomes so much lighter. That weight becomes so much lighter and we allow him to carry that. Some of you are carrying burdens for people that you were never meant to carry. You were never meant to carry them. You were meant to surrender them to the Lord. And right now the Lord wants to take the heavy heart, the heavy hearts. Maybe it's for more than one person in this room. And he wants you to surrender that thing and trust him. He says, will you trust me? Will you trust me? Will you lay that thing down and let me carry it? Maybe it's salvation like Jesse was talking about. You cannot be the savior of your own life. You cannot be the savior of somebody else's life. It's only through the blood of Jesus Christ. Maybe it's your finances. Maybe it's your children. Maybe it's your marriage. Maybe it's your health. Maybe it's the ambitions and dreams. Maybe it's your business. He's saying, will you lay that down? Will you lay that down? Will you trust me?
like you just received um, some tragic news recently, and I feel like you're carrying that heaviness of a burden. I don't know if it's a, a sick, a sick one, or you've got some bad news personally, or it's someone that you love. I just feel strongly that as someone on this side of the room that just got some bad news recently. And the Lord wants you to come and surrender that to Him this morning. If you're tired of carrying that heaviness and you want to be free from that and have peace, just receive that word and come forward. I just feel like that specifically for someone on the right side of the room.
this morning. And uh, like always, we'll start in the back and come forward. So let's, uh, let's ask the blessing on the offering. Father, we thank you. We thank you, first of all, Lord God, for touching us with your presence, Lord. We thank you for true worship, Lord God, that draws us into the presence of Jesus. And Lord, when we come into your presence, Lord, we find that you are merciful that you are gracious and that you love us so deeply. And so, Lord, I ask, Lord God, that you continue to do the work in the hearts of the people this morning. Lord, those that have been prayed for or, or still praying for, Lord, we just pray that your Holy Spirit would just minister to them today. And, Lord, we ask you to bless the offering, Father God, that we use wisdom in dispersing it, Lord God. And we just thank you for each one. And we pray that you would bless each one in Jesus' name. And it's as his name we pray and everyone said, amen. amen. You can start from the back and work your way forward. Amen. God is good. Amen. We're never gonna we're never gonna rush through. We're gonna allow the Holy Spirit to do what the Holy Spirit wants to do. And uh, I just said to the worship team before they came out, I said I just feel like we, you know, I, I just felt I don't know about you, but I felt dry. And I know it's not about feeling, but I was really trusting the Lord to really minister to people today, and I'm thankful to see that that's exactly what He did. Um, at this time, Children's Church is dismissed, so you can meet. Who's, who is Children's Church today? Who? Oh, that's right. She, Ruth had to check out this morning. So uh, maybe Kelsey. Is Kelsey back there? Or Beth? Sorry, guys. Yeah, I'm not sure, but Ruth asked for our prayers this morning, so please remember Ruth yes. in prayer. I'm not sure what, what happened, but um, we do remember her in prayer. Amen. with you this morning that the Lord pricked my heart this week and I was uh, preparing a message on prayer and it was really a continuation of last week's message and you know, somewhere along the line I just felt like the Lord wanted me to go in a little, little bit different direction this morning so I won't specifically be talking about prayer this morning but I don't usually title my messages but if I would put a title on this message I would title it, Choosing, Choosing Not to Fight. Choosing Not to Fight. And, you know, we sing these songs, we fight our battles on our knees, and, and we, that's how we fight in the kingdom. We don't, we don't physically fight. We fight on our knees through prayer and worship and all those good kind of things. But this morning, I'm, I want to give you an example in Scripture where a warrior... Uh, a, a 
man that God said he's a bloody man because he had he had so much blood on his hand for killing. Um, he was a, a mighty warrior, and he was also king of Israel, and his name was David. And so this morning, I want to just share a couple of scripture with you this morning. Um, and it's found in, we're going to start in 2 Samuel chapter 15, verse 14. Now, before I read, as I was praying back there, the Lord reminded me of a couple of things in my life, in my past. And growing up, and even into my um, young adulthood, I was a fighter. I was always getting in fights. Um, I think I have the school record for most games being thrown out of for fighting <laughs> in, in high school. And uh, the coach used to come to me, hey, we need you the whole game today. So, But I, I just had this thing that when I saw injustice, I just couldn't keep my mouth closed. And a lot of times it turned into physical fight. But the one time, a friend of mine, we were on the wrestling team together, and something happened in the wrestling room and all that, and... Uh, him and I got into a tiff, and then he wanted to fight. And I remember saying to him, I'm not going to fight you. And the fact of the matter is, if we would fight ten times out of ten times, I would have beaten him ten times out of ten times. But I chose not to fight because I knew that it would do something to our relationship. Mm -hmm. So in order, in order to protect that relationship, I, I just said, I'm not fighting. I said, if you want to take a swing... Go ahead and take a swing, but I am not going to fight. And this is coming from somebody who fought all the time, but I just, there is something inside of me that said, I choose not to fight this day. Right now, I choose not to fight. And so I want us to read about King David. And this is a, just a very interesting portion of Scripture. There's a lot going on. There's a backstory here. And let me just say that Absalom, Absalom, David's son, and most of us know this story. Absalom, David's son, said that he was going to go after his father's throne. So he began to undermine David. He began to do all kinds of things to sway men to his side. And in rebellion, he took his, he, he, he was going after his father's throne. And so um, Absalom is coming, and he's coming to Jerusalem, and he's coming to kill David. And David chooses not to stay and fight, but David chooses to leave. And so it says in 2 Samuel chapter 15, verse 14, it said, So David said to all his servants who were with him at Jerusalem, Arise and flee, or we shall not escape from Absalom. Make haste to depart, lest he overtake us suddenly and bring disaster upon us and strike the city with the edge of the sword. Now I want you to notice David's thoughts in this portion of scripture. He's concerned with Absalom not killing him or killing his warriors, but he's worried about the city. David is concerned about Jerusalem. And listen, when we look at Jerusalem, it is a picture, it is a picture of the church. It is Zion. It is a picture of the kingdom of God. So in essence, what David was worrying about, David was worrying and he was concerned about the city. And he wanted them to leave because he knew that he knew that his son Absalom was in such rebellion that he would come and he would wipe out an entire city trying to get to David. Mm. And then it continues in 2 Samuel chapter 15, verse number 15. And the king's servant said to the kings, We are your servants. Ready to do whatsoever my lord the king commands. And now jump down to verse 23. And this is David as he's leaving the city. And all the country wept with a loud voice, and all the people crossed over. The king himself also crossed over the brook Kidron. And all the people crossed over toward the way of the wilderness. There was Zadok also, and all, all the Levites with him, bearing the Ark of the Covenant of God. Now there's such a deep history with the Ark of the Covenant in David. David was the one when he became king, and Saul was king for 20 years, and Saul never inquired of the Ark, the Bible says. And we know that the Ark of God represents the power and the presence of God, and 
David, one of the first things he did when he became king is he went down to Kirith Jerim in Obed Edom's house and he was going down to bring the Ark of the Covenant back to Jerusalem. And David's desire was the Ark of the Covenant represents the power and presence of God and he wanted to bring that back to the center of his leadership and he wanted to bring it to the capital city of Israel, Jerusalem. So here as they're leaving the city, the priests, Zadok, and, and their, the Levites are carrying the Ark of the Covenant with them. And then the next verse says, And they set down the Ark, and Abathar went up until all the people had crossed, finished crossing over from the city. Then the king said to Zadok, Carry the Ark of God back into the city. If I find favor in the eyes of the Lord, he will bring me back and show me both it and his dwelling place. But if he says, thus, I have no delight in you, here I am, let him do to me as it seems good to him. Father, we pray over the next few minutes, Lord God, that you would prick our hearts. I pray, Father God, that you would speak clearly to us. Lord, we understand the great preacher, the Holy Spirit is here this morning. And he is present and we welcome your presence here, Jesus. We welcome the Holy Spirit here. Lord, I pray that you would prick our hearts, Lord, that you would plant a seed inside of us, Lord God, that would spring forth with fruit and principles of your word coming forth in our life. And Lord, we pray that you would bind every hindering spirit in the mighty name of Jesus and that you would have your way in our lives in this room today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Now, I want, to, I want to mostly focus on verse 14. So if you could put that back up there, Marlena. He said, David said, we need to make haste and depart, lest he overtake us suddenly in disaster upon us and strike or smite the city with the edge of the sword. I want to speak to you on the subject of choosing not to fight. And that's exactly what was taking place here. David at this time is king of Israel and his own son Absalom has decided to take his father's throne. So Absalom attacks, overtakes and rebels against his father and is taking his father's kingdom and he's coming to Jerusalem. He's coming to the, the city of God because he knows David is there and he's going to destroy the city just to get to David. And in our text, David has to make a decision. He's got to make a decision because Absalom's, Absalom is coming for him and he's coming for Jerusalem. And David has to make a decision whether to fight or flee. Now, how many times have you heard that in your life, church? And we have people who get addicted and they become, have a fight or flight mentality. Now, that's not what we're talking about here. We're talking about a warrior. And he's a fighter, church, and he has to make a decision whether he's going to stay and fight for his beloved Jerusalem or is he going to leave it and surrender it to his son Absalom. So David says to his servants, we are going to leave. We are going to flee Jerusalem. And they said to David, David, whatever you want us to do, we will do. If you want us to fight, we will fight. If you want us to flee, if you want us to, to just give it up, we will. You just tell us what to do. These were David's mighty men of God, mighty warriors. And David said, we need to leave. We need to leave this place lest Absalom smite the city with the edge of the sword. And when you see that term, it means somebody's coming for blood. And understand, church, that God sees everything. God knows everything. We have, we have nothing that we can hide from God. He sees it all. And let me tell you, church, today as he did in this day, God is sovereign. He's the sovereign God of the universe. And he can do whatever he wants, whenever he wants. And he can, he can buck your tradition. And he, can, he doesn't have to do things your way. And he probably won't do them your way. But we have to understand the sovereignty of God just like David did. And I believe in that sovereignty. Yes. And we see that belief that David has because he said to Zadok, he said, if, if, if God wants me to have the kingdom, I'll have the kingdom. I'll be back. Right. And 
David said, in other words, I believe David was saying, it's God's kingdom. Yes. It's, it's his city. It's, listen to me, it's his church. Amen. It's his house. It's his ministry. It's his, it's not mine. And if God, it is, it is God's will for me to come back to Jerusalem, I'll be back. But if it's God's will for Absalom to take the throne, then so be it. But God is sovereign and David trusted in the sovereignty of God, just like you and I have to, church. Because we can get into spats and we can get into situations that completely make sense to us that we're right and we have all authority and we're on good ground to make a decision, but God is saying no. And that's what's going on here. And David, <clears throat> David's attitude was that he was trusting in whatever God wanted for him, for Jerusalem, and for his life. So David said, we're going to leave. And when I think about this story, I never really thought about this until this week. Because I always thought David loved Absalom so much in spite of Absalom's rebellion, in spite of Absalom's... I mean, a Absalom was coming after David. It was, it was so obvious that he, he hated his father. But I thought, okay, he's leaving the city because he just doesn't want to have a confrontation with his son Absalom. So he chose to flee and not to fight. But church, that's not why David chose to leave. That's not David's heart. What was mulling around in David's heart, and I believe the Holy Spirit was so involved in this decision. But David was concerned about the city. David was concerned about the church. Zion, the picture of the church and the, the kingdom of God. And David was under intimate threat and was concerned about the city, not his position. Church, are you hearing me? Yes. David was more concerned about the big picture. He was more concerned about the city of Jerusalem than he was his own position. And David was saying under threat of attack, this isn't about me. Amen. This isn't about Absalom. This isn't about my position. This isn't about me, church. And you know what? It's not about you either. Amen. Hmm. And he says, the reason I choose not to fight is because the city is what's most important. See, it's not important sometimes what you want. It's not important what I want. See, we've got to learn to big it, look at the big picture, and we've got to learn to say, what's good for the kingdom? What's good for Jerusalem? What's good for the church? See, we're always getting bogged down in our feelings and our agendas. But church, David's attitude is, I'm not going to fight because that's what's best for the city. Absalom wants to destroy the city, but David, in his heart, he didn't want to see the blood of the innocent people flowing in the streets. He didn't want innocent people, the bystanders, standards, the bystanders to be slaughtered in the streets. And he said, I will choose to leave this city to protect the city. Amen. Church, are you seeing this picture? See, when we understand that God is sovereign, when we understand that the sovereignty of God and men come and go, and when you understand that He makes no mistakes, Matter of fact, the Bible says in Psalms 41, 45, 17, He is righteous in all His ways. In other words, all of His ways, He is right. We might not see it that way when things go down and things happen and it's like you're, you feel like your heart's being ripped out of your chest and God sees the whole picture and He knows that there's good in that for you somewhere, somehow, but it ain't about you. 
I remember we went through a painful, painful place years ago. And we had left a church that my sons were uh, baptized in that church. I was married in that church. My, my children or my kids were dedicated to the Lord. Every important religious thing happened in that church. And we had to leave. And it was gut-wrenching. I remember I went to the pastor's house and I, I, I knocked on his door and I opened his door. I said, what kind of man are you? I said, they don't do this stuff in the world, and yet you do it in the house of God. How dare you? It was painful. And as painful as it was for me and my family, it was even more painful for Dan and my sister Fran. But I will tell you, I didn't understand the sovereignty of God. But I will tell you this morning that Restoration Ministries would not exist if we didn't go through that situation. If we didn't go through that fire, nothing would ever happen here. This would never be here. In all God's ways, He is right. All His ways. And I didn't write this whole scripture out, but Romans 8, 5, 8, 5, 8, 5 says that the, the carnal man, the carnal mind cannot discern the things of the spirit. So if you're in a situation and you make up your mind that God has to do it this way, he's got to do it at this time, and there's no, there's no uh, other way you're looking at, you will never understand that his ways are not your ways. And you're going to get frustrated. You're not going to understand that his thoughts and his ways are higher than yours. Amen. Man, I would have never imagined when we went through that years ago that this would happen. Man. See, we need to thank the Lord, church. We need to thank him that he is in complete control. That he is the sovereign of the universe. And he's got under control the things that are going on in our nation and in our homes and in our churches. Nothing is, is taking him by surprise. God never had an epiphany. He knows everything. And we've got to be like David and we've got to, we've got to just trust in his sovereignty. Knowing, he's, knowing what he's doing, he is right. He's right. See, David loved God. And because he loved God, he loved what God loved. Amen. David loved God's word and he loved God's people. He loved the house of God. Yes. He loved the city of God, the city of Zion, Jerusalem. And he loved what God loved because his love for God was first. Boy, we've got to learn to trust him, don't we? When I read stuff like this and study stuff like this, I'm like, wow, we got to really get this. See, church, if we don't love, if you don't love God first and you don't love him best, you won't love the things you're supposed to love. Yep. Amen. If I don't love God, I'm not going to love God's people. Yep. If I don't love God, I'm not going to love my brothers and sisters in the church. I'm not going to love the church. I'm going to be more concerned about my agenda than I am what God wants in the church. Mm -hmm. The king. I just imagine David out in the fields and just falling in love with God. Mm -hmm. And some of those psalms and, you know, he would write and sing to God. He'd live in the field in the middle of the night and he's just worshiping God. But he's falling in love with God, and that's what David did. See, there's two things about David that amazes me. Maybe it amazes you too, or maybe you've never thought about it. But one of the things that impresses me about David is he never cheated on God. Amen. David never had an illicit love affair with an idol or another God. And was David, David, I mean, he never worshipped an idol, but, you know, did he make mistakes? He sure did. Mm -hmm. He made many mistakes. He did a lot of bad things. But he never worshipped any other gods. Amen. 
It was like David said, there's one God and I know Him. I know who He is and I will serve Him. I will never worship another idol. Even if I fail, even if I fall, I'm going to come back and I'm going to worship Jehovah the Lord. The other thing that I thought about David is amazing because he's a man of war. He's a warrior. He's a fighter. But he has never, ever, ever raised his sword against his own brothers and sisters and flesh and blood. Amen. Now I want you to think about this, church. When you look at David's life, we see that he was a warrior, that he was a fighter. And I think I've covered that pretty good. I might say it six, seven more times. But when we see this, it's not easy for him to choose not to fight. When my friend got on my face many years ago and wanted to go throw down, and I mean, it was hard for me not to do that because it would have just been real easy just to, just to punch him and probably knock him out. And I'm serious, George. So it was hard for David not to fight. It was hard for him just to walk away from the throne and his beloved Jerusalem. It couldn't have been easy, but even instinctively, everything inside of David screamed, fight, fight. Because he was a fighter. He was the man who fought the lion and the bear. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to die a detour right here real quick. I was thinking about this, this is so true. When David fought the bear and the lion, there was a threat to his family's welfare. See, when he defeated the lion and the bear, he was watching over the family's sheep. See, the lion and the bear came to hurt the family business. And if the lion and the bear can hurt the family business, that hurts his family's livelihood. Someone say amen. Amen. So David was, was protecting the family's finances. They were, he was protecting the family's livelihood. And so then we know there's another incident, I think it's in 2 Samuel, that he fights and slays Goliath. Now if you study that out, you'll understand that David was fighting for the nation's welfare. He was, you know, that, that, that uh, giant would stood there and he would curse God and the, Phil and the, and the Israelites and he would just... You know, he would just make mockery of them. So David fights Goliath and he defeats him. And it's for the welfare of a whole nation. And I thought about this, church. How often we are so concerned about facing the giant. That we're so uh, uh, concerned about what's going on nationally and, uh, you know, fighting that, that, that giant in the nation. But the lion and the bear in our own homes, we're not defending. We're not fighting against them in our own homes. Amen. See, listen, it's not the government. It's not jumping Joe Biden. Preach. Or Kamala Harris, or Congress, or the House of Representatives that's going to determine how much of God I have in my home. Amen. So we can pretend all this, but church, you got to do you got to do the battle against the lion and the bear in your own home. What are your children listening to? What are your children watching? What are, your, are your kids watching TikTok? You should throw that phone right in the, a, the deepest puddle of water you can find because that's filth. Yes. See, we're concerned about the giant ruling the nation, but we can't even handle the lion and the bear in our own home. Preach. Preach, so we can't even dare to go after the giant if we're not dealing with the lion and the bear. Amen. Amen. And you know how the enemy loves to come after our families. See, David was a warrior. He fought lions and bears and giants. It was his instinct and he was surrounded by warriors. He was surrounded by trained killers, battle-tested warriors that would do anything. They would defend to their last breath. They would follow every order that David gave them. 
But God said that David was such a bloody man that he wouldn't allow him to build his temple. That's how bloody David was. Mm. See, David knew how to fight. He fought many battles and many armies. He fought the bravest and the best and the strongest and the mightiest armies, and he defeated them all. Amen. Now I'm just saying all this because now he's going to walk away from a fight. But now comes a moment in time against all of his instincts and everything inside of him. David chooses not to fight. And I strongly, strongly believe that he is moved by the Holy Spirit and says, this time I choose not to fight. This time I choose to abdicate the throne. I choose to go with what God is telling me to do. And I don't feel like I'm supposed to fight. Mm. Gosh, help us. Amen. I feel like if I don't flee, and if I feel like I fight, there's going to be so many innocent bystanders that are going to be killed. There's going to be blood in the street because Absalom will strike this city with the edge of the storm. If I stay and fight, people will die. It'll be a civil war. There'll be more division in Israel than they had ever known up until that moment. So I'm going to put it in the hands of God. I'm going to trust His sovereignty. And see, here in this text, church, the true heart of David, the true person that David was, is revealed in that David love, had great love for the city and the people. It's as if David was saying, I don't want Absalom to smite the city of God. So I choose to leave. I choose to leave and not fight and trust in the sovereignty of God. I don't want to see the church. Listen. When you're ready to fight, you got to have, I don't want to see the church of God. I don't want to see the city of God, Zion, to be wiped out. So I got to stop fighting. At some point, we have to choose not to fight. They're going to get it before it's over. Everyone is. I almost like David would say, I choose not to fight for a greater end. Are you following me, church? Yes. David was saying, I love God's kingdom so much. I love God so much. I love his people so much that I'm going to walk away from this. I mean, church, that's a beautiful, insightful picture of how it should be in the church. I mean, God gave his only son, Jesus. Yes, thank you, Lord. God gave his only son. And we got to get the big picture. He gave us his only son and he was... He, he was bloodied and battered and he hung on a cross so we could have forgiveness for, his, for our sins. Yes. And all David didn't understand Jesus, he understood what God was putting in his heart and he couldn't let his own personal feelings cause him to fight when he needed to choose not to fight. Yes. And here's the thing, church, nobody, nobody had defended the city of Jerusalem and blessed it more than David had. I mean, history records that he's the one who took it from the Jebusites. David's the one who crawled up the cesspools, or those cisterns, those, those things. He crawled up in the sewage to get inside those walls of the city to take the city. The city that the Bible says sits on the seven hills. He took it. And for him now to choose not to fight and defend it, he had to hear from God. Because he, he had great courage. See, church, I want you to listen to me. There's going to be times in your life where God's going to ask you not to choose to fight. There's going to be times when everything inside of you knows that it's your right to fight. And don't buddy, anybody say, party. Some of us older ones get that. But sometimes he's going to tell you not to fight. You choose not to fight, even though you think you're right. And you have the right to fight. See, even when your mind, even in your mind, you think 
you're right about this and you think you're on solid ground to fight, God is going to say, don't fight. Think about this church. David had every right to fight. Nobody had done more for the city. Nobody had uh, uh, enlarged its territory. Nobody had caused more uh, prosperity to come to that city than to David. And David gave up his right to fight. No one had done more for the city, and to this day it's known as what? The city of David. Why would he walk away? Why would he walk away from a city that he loved and a throne that he loved? Well, I honestly believe because the Lord is using this, this portion of Scripture, to teach us a biblical principle. See, there are going to be times in life when the Holy Spirit moves on you and says, I don't want you to choose fighting now. I don't want you to say another word. I just want you to trust me. I just don't fight. I remember when Lucas was born. And there was some debate. Both Kenia and Chris were doing real good. And we got a phone call that they weren't going to name Lucas, Lucas Eby. I was ready to fight. I'm telling you, I was madder than a hornet. And you know how the devil is. And I knew where this was coming from. This wasn't coming from her. It was coming from her father. And maybe they'll see it on Facebook. I don't know. And I go, I'm walking, to, 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 just because I'm mad, I'm walking to blow off steam. And I come to the turkey hill over here, and who's there? Yeah. <laughs> wow. And I remember I was ready to say something, I heard God say, shut your mouth. Yeah. Don't you say a word. And you know what? It was everything inside of me not to fight. His name is Lucas Pencil Eby. But I'm telling you, if I were to fight, how about it, Jordan? It would have been no, no. <laughs> hey, because at that time, I didn't know fight. I didn't know Jordan was going to have a boy. I didn't know Chris was going to have another boy. He was the only grandchild. What if he's the only one? He's the only one that can carry on my name. That's how my mind's thinking. <laughs> Amen. 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 But there's going to become a time when the Lord says, I know you're right. I know you're right, Kayla. They, they've done you wrong and it was wrong, but I don't want you to fight no more. Amen. I want you to choose not to fight and trust me. See, there are people on the sidelines, if we choose to fight, if we continue to choose to engage, there are people on the sidelines that are going to be smitten with the sword. Mm -hmm. And you're like, what are you talking about? Well, I'm going to tell you, and I've said this many times, it's such a, a beautiful picture of how Jesus thinks about his body, his church. We all know the story in Acts where Paul is Saul is persecuting the church. He's, he's having Christians stoned and he's, he's just, she's, she's just persecuting them to death. And he has the Damascus Road experience and he's riding blind and God strikes him off the, the pony or horse, whatever he's on. And the Lord said, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting my body? I mean, Saul did nothing to Jesus. Nothing. But when he was persecuting his bride and he was persecuting the body of Christ, Jesus took it so personal like he was doing it to him. So church, next time you want to start firing at somebody, you want to take out your sword this thing, you want to take out your sword and start committing verbal assassination to other Christians and other believers, just remember you are injuring the body of Christ and Jesus takes it serious. Yes. Amen. Amen. When they're ready to take Jesus in the Garden of Eden and Peter, Peter would have been a great person to do guerrilla warfare. 
He just was like, he's out there, Jordan. He's like us. <laughs> so they come for Jesus, and out comes the, sh the sword from his sheath, and he takes off the ear of one of the soldiers. And Jesus says, put up your sword. Those of you who live by the sword will die by the sword. Church, we should never pull our swords. Amen. Never. Not when it comes to the body of Christ, especially. Someone say amen. amen. Jesus. So, if we choose to fight when the Lord is saying no, you know, you and I might survive the fight and we might even win the fight, but the price and the loss of all those other people is such a high cost to pay. Amen. See, not, and I'm not really talking about people in the church. I'm talking about the people outside the church or who are hearing us proclaim how God is love and He loves them and, you know, all this stuff. And then we're in here slinging mud and getting swords and... You're probably thinking, boy, I wish you wouldn't preached about prayer again. No. 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 I would that might not that wouldn't have been a bad thing. Because <laughs> then it's gonna get even heavier. Okay. Jesus. See Absalom Absalom is so full of himself. Mm. He's so arrogant. He's in such rebellion that as David's getting ready to leave the city, or before he leaves, Absalom is setting trumpeters into the streets of Israel and proclaiming, and they're blowing trumpets, proclaiming that Absalom is king. Wow. And David is in this position that he could have stood up and successfully fought and won and beat Absalom's army, but he did not. He said, I will not fight. There's going to be too much blood in the streets. And the reason David said that, he wanted to preserve the city of God. Amen. I will let my ego die right here because I'm not going to fight. Amen. Because I'm not fighting for a greater purpose. See, we fight for great things. We fight on our knees. We war on our knees. Yeah. But sometimes God is saying, you guys need to keep your mouth closed and just trust me and let my sovereignty rule the day. Amen. See, David understood a powerful principle. The church, I'm not, I'm not talking about politics today. I'm not talking about the craziness that we see in our leaders. I'm talking about the church. I'm talking about our families. See, what I've learned and I've seen my whole life, there's way too much contention and fights in churches. Yep. There's way too much contentions and fighting in our own families. There's contentions between brothers and sisters in Christ, and there's fights between members of our own physical families and our own spiritual families. And there comes a time when we have to make the choice to choose not to fight anymore. It's not worth the high cost. See, David made a decision not to fight in order to preserve the city of God. And there are times that you have to make a decision not to fight. And when you know you're right, that's hard to do. But God is going to ask you to do that even when you know you're right, even when others think you're right. Even though you got that people next to you telling you're right, you're right, you have a right to fight, this is wrong, and you go get them, tiger. How many of spiritual people do that? I'm going to tell you something about our area. They love to talk. I told you about this true story. Janie has a restaurant and there's a table full of people and as she's walking over to get the order, she hears the one lady say, oh, you know that Pastor Paul Evie? And her ears perked up and the one guy said, yeah, I know. Would well, you know he beats his wife? What? I'm, ask Janie, true story. Wow. 
And, she, and the lady's like, I heard it from a good source. I heard it from one of his neighbors that he beats his wife. Oh my God. The devil was a liar. I was ready to fight. <laughs> I went to both my neighbors and said, did you say this to somebody? Because, and they're both really good neighbors. I didn't, and they have nothing to say. I mean, have I yelled? Yeah. And I said, let me tell you something. If I beat my wife, the first thing that would happen is she would find the biggest heaviest object she could lift and she would hit me with it and then she would call the cops. No questions. No questions. But we like to talk in this community. But you know what? Would I have been right to fight? See, it doesn't matter when people even are telling you how right you are. There's times when God's going to say, don't fight. Wow. See, it doesn't matter. That's deep. What matters is, do you love them? Amen. Do you love your family? Do you love your family that you're at war with, church? Do you love your church? See, that's what matters. Do I love them? Because at some point, we've got to quit fighting and we just got to embrace one another in love and just let it go. You've got to give up your right to be right. Yes. For His glory, for a greater purpose. Yes. See, church, we have to preserve the church. Amen. We've got to preserve our families. We've got to preserve our marriages. Yes. If you're fighting in your marriage, you don't have to be right. You just need to stop. Because the enemy loves to destroy marriages. He loves to drive a wedge between a husband and a wife. He loves that church. Yes. And you might be right to fight, but he's telling you, don't fight. Trust me. Amen. Trust my sovereignty. See, David was concerned, more concerned about the preservation and the health of the city of Jerusalem. Now listen to me. Jerusalem. David's heart was Jerusalem. Oh. At all costs must we stay intact. At all costs. So much good is going to come out of Israel, out of Jerusalem. And David might not have seen it, but he understands the wooing of God. And there's so much good that's going to come out of Jerusalem. Salvation is going to come out of Jerusalem. Prophecies are going to come out of Jerusalem that changes the world. Jesus someday is going to rule from Jerusalem. Amen. And David's heart was at all costs, we must stay intact. See, David was like, I can't let the city be destroyed because my ego was hurt. I can't let the church be destroyed because... My agenda didn't go through, or I didn't get what I wanted, and my, my feelings were hurt. Listen, church, I never asked to be the pastor. I, know. I knew God was calling me, but I never went in and demanded and said, I demand it. No, I knew that God was calling me. I knew that if anybody else stood behind this desk as a pastor, they would be in error. And I'm not saying that arrogantly, but I knew it, and I knew it, and I knew it. But this ain't my church. This ain't my kingdom. I didn't die for anybody. You did. You did it. Jesus did. So anytime that God says, Paul, I really don't want you here, then I'm out of here because I don't want to be where God doesn't want me to be. But we see so much fighting. I want you to listen to me. How much more should we, for the house of God, be willing to set aside our personal feelings and set aside our agendas and our personal feelings and say, I don't want injury. I don't want suffering to come to the people who are out there looking for Jesus. while the church is having a civil war. The devil loves to drive wedges and separate people, especially in the church. David could have 
said, I can fight and I can win. He could have left his lust for revenge bring greater division. Because David was not one to run from the fight. But he was doing what he was doing to preserve the city. Amen. I hope this touches you like it did me. Yes. We should never speak, we should never speak negatively about our church family. Amen. Thank you, Donna. You're welcome. I paid her to be here today. <laughs> we should never speak negatively of our church. Amen. If you have a problem, church, with somebody or me, just come talk. Come talk. And listen, I'm not preaching this because we have all got, because we don't, we don't, have, we don't have all these problems. But I know where God wants us to go, and we've got to really tighten the ship. Yeah. Is that a phrase? Yeah, I don't know. We've got to batten down the hatches. Because God wants to do, just like Jerusalem, so much was coming out of Jerusalem that David said, I've got to do all I can to keep this city intact. There's so much more coming out of Restoration Ministries. And we got to, with all of our heart and mind, say, Lord, I don't want to injure this place. I don't want to injure your body. I want this place to stay intact. And I want it to grow in Jesus' name. See, the world, we need to protect this place. See, Jesus is the one who died. Yes. And the last thing that I'll say is Jesus the one who bled and died on the cross. And the last thing that you and I should do is picking up our sword and using them on one another. Amen. Or in your family. Amen. Somebody got to quit being so hard-nosed on your kids. And I'm not saying don't discipline them. But I don't know, my Bible says something, it says provoke not your children to wrath. And I don't mean let them get away with stuff, but sometimes we're so heavy handed and they see us arguing with our wife and they see us, hear us talking about the church and blah, blah, blah. What do you think is going to happen to your son and daughter after they listen to that over and over again? You've just given them up to the lion and the bear. You gotta fight for them yes. on your knees, church. Yes. Amen. See, we gotta protect the, our churches and our families because the world needs the church like it's never needed it before. Amen. Amen. And it's time to choose not to fight. Amen. There's too much at stake. Our church, our family, the lost. Listen, it wouldn't be hard for any one of us to find somebody who says they will never darken the doorway of a church because they were injured in the church. And so what they do is they equate that church injury with our loving Heavenly Father. And a lot of stuff has happened, bad stuff has happened in Jesus' name. But it wasn't Jesus. It wasn't Jesus. But what does the Bible say? The Bible says they will know. Oh, I'm going to get it wrong. They will know our love. James. Yeah, by our love for one another. That's how when the Lord sees me and Jesse loving one another, or me and Don alone, or me and Eller. That attracts them, church. Yes. That's too precious to let go. So we got to choose. We got to choose not to fight, but we got to choose to fight on our knees. Amen. 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 Let's stand. And we're going to close the word of prayer. I want everybody to know that youth group is tonight at six thirty. John, you're a little too old for youth group, but. What are the ages of that? No. 11 to 40? <laughs> yeah, 11 to high school. Amen. So Jesse has some good stuff planned for tonight. Yeah. I'm going to ask you to do something different.
different. I want you all to just lift up your hands. No one looking around. Just lift them up. Jesus. Father, I pray that you would see, that we would see the church like you see us. As your loving bride. Lord, that you would look, that we would look at one another as someone that Jesus literally died for. And Lord, that we would look at our marriages the way you do. And we would look at our families the way you do, Lord. And Lord, that we would choose to end the battle, Lord. That we would choose to end the argument. That we would choose to end the fight, Lord. And I'm not saying we, we got to we gotta work things out. we got to talk about things, Lord. But we just can't let this unending grudge bearing continue. So Lord, I just pray that, we would, that you would touch each one of us. And Lord, that we make a decision, I'm not going to fight. Lord, that we walk away for the greater good, knowing that something good is going to come out of this place. That something good is going to come out of here, Lord. Something good is going to come out of my family. Something good is going to come out of my, my marriage, Lord God, that's going to impact the world. Help us, Lord. The devil is a liar. We just ask you to come and fill us with your Holy Spirit. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. And everyone said, Amen. 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 The altars are open or you can feel dismissed. Yourself this way.